you a few of announcements. Uh, if you're visiting, of course, we welcome you to fill out a connection card, and uh, we have uh, a gift for you, and uh, we're not going to harass you, but uh, if you'll fill that out, that would be greatly appreciated. 
Uh, also, um, baptism. We're going to be baptizing uh, very soon. We have uh, a load of youth who were saved at Caswell. We have a couple adults who are waiting. And what I need for you to do, youth, if you would see Youth Pastor Dave, uh, make sure he has your name and a Sunday that you know you're not going to be here. And then for the rest of you, those of you who have placed your faith in Christ, you're choosing to follow uh, Jesus and you need to make that public. Uh, if you would also note on the connection card uh, that you would like to be baptized and we will be in touch with you and we'll do a date uh, that we can get uh, everyone here. So please keep uh, that in mind. Also, if you have any prayer requests, uh, note that on the connection card. And uh, there's a group who meet uh, a couple of times a week and then pray every day. Uh, for those needs and we've seen some tremendous answer to prayer uh, so keep that in mind and if you have anything that you won't pray for in that way please note that then this Saturday morning uh, at nine o'clock uh, the men are going to meet in the fellowship hall uh, for time of food and fellowship and uh, if you haven't been coming uh, make it a point uh, to be here this Saturday and then if you're going to come Harley wants to know if you're going to be here just trying to get an idea about how many guys are going to be here this Saturday. Um, I don't want to order too much food. Definitely not, not enough. So, Okay. All right. Thank you. You know, all the men who have your hands up, just stare everybody down. You raise your Hey, look, if you guys have a band, honestly, there, there, there's, there's no lesson. There's no sermon. You guys get a sermon on Sunday. You'll get that from me on Sunday. Oh, it is. It's a time of fellowship. And a good one, I might add to that, Harley. You should have said a good sermon on Sunday. A good one. If you have heart issues, you may want to bring a bowl of oatmeal with you um, on that. Uh, this, this breakfast will send you to heaven real soon. Uh, but here's the cool thing, and this is why I push this, okay? It's not just an announcement, but discipleship happens at these tables. Um, you have mature Christians there who are sitting with new Christians, and there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one discipleship about life in the Christian faith that happens. So if you're a young Christian and you're recently, you want to be around some men who are living this thing, who are trying to live this thing, it's a great opportunity for you to get some good godly uh, counsel and discipleship because it does happen. We don't preach a sermon that day, but there is discipleship that's happening at each of those tables. Uh, so you plan to be here, and when you're done, if you've got to go mow your yard, you can leave, all right? You're not going to be held, but feel free to come. And for those of you who raised your hand, you ought to find somebody and invite them to come meet them in the parking lot so it's not awkward uh, to walk in because some of y'all are extremely introverts and you're not going to do that without some help. So uh, they'll be glad to help you do that. So keep that in mind this Saturday morning at 9 o'clock and uh, make plans to be here. Um, who's had a good week? And the rest of y'all had a bad week? How many of y'all watch the news this week? And you still had a bad week? <laughs> Listen, keep this in mind. Um, if it was a tough week, you're probably going to have a tough week again at some point. In the future. If you had a great week, you're probably going to have a tough week again at some point in the future. And I'm going to remind you again of what's going to bring you through that is realizing how big and how good your God is. And the fact that you are saved, born again, a Christ follower, your sins have been forgiven, that makes every day a good day. Right? So don't forget that. So don't forget that. God, today we come before you, and uh, God, we certainly acknowledge that we need you. And God, we don't even have to watch the news to realize that we need you in this world, in this life. And so God, today we pray that God would be reminded of how good you are, God, how big you are. 
And God, that even though it's a crazy world, even though it's a sin-sick world, messed up, God, ultimately you still have the whole world in your hands. And so God, today, while we're doing life in this place, in this world, God, may we be mindful of just how much we need you. And the more wicked and evil it gets, God, may we be reminded of just how much we need you. And God, may we also be reminded there's a better day coming. And God, there is a, a place that is being prepared for us. And so God, I pray that we would uh, live in a way, God, that shows that we're looking forward for the world to come. And God, today all this is made possible through Jesus Christ. And God, I pray that as we worship Him corporately, as we worship Him with people uh, who believe like we do, people who know there's a God, there's a Savior. God, I pray that we would forget about this past week. And God, we pray that we would focus on who you are. Holy Spirit, we are 100% dependent upon you. And God, in this time, in this day, we need you like never before. God, we pray that you would shower us with your presence, God, and your peace as we exalt you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, would you stand with me? This next song is uh, called Egypt, and the theme of it is that God is the God who fights for us in all of our situations. Psalms 34, 17 says, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. And then in Deuteronomy, it's recorded, this is after God has uh, led the people out of Egypt. They say, the Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Let's sing this next song.
There's a grace when my heart is hungry by Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this frame I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Come every 
If our uh, children's church children's church leaders, uh, we're going to let you go ahead and exit. If you're doing children's church today, and then all those uh, fourth grade and below, uh, you will go to the uh, fellowship hall through those doors, and they will meet you there. All right, good morning. Uh, this week, this Wednesday, youth, we are mixing it up. We will be at cookout. 
and putt-putt on the north end. So come and join us. Uh, watch for the post uh, about what time. it probably be around 5.30. Um, so youth, we'll be at putt-putt and cookout uh, this upcoming Wednesday. Fall Caswell signups have already begun. We are almost full. If you are a rising sixth grader, you need to sign up to go on this trip. Uh, it is an outstanding trip. It is November the 10th. It is on Veterans Day uh, through that Sunday. That is our fall retreat this year. So youth, um, we already have 40 plus signed up. Please make sure if you have not signed up yet to make sure you get signed up. We're running out of space um, from where we're going to be. Uh, so see us after church uh, to sign up for this. All right. Uh, at this time, if our ushers would please come forward. All right, Caden, if you'll pray, please. Let's pray, man. Dear God, thank you for this time to just come before you. Um, God, I just pray for um, any hearts that need to be moved that you will be with them. And um, I pray for any heartache and any you know, thing on this thing, God, that you will do that. And um, I just pray that you will just be through, just walk through us and help us to speak your word in our lives, just through everyone in our life, God. And I pray for this offering that will be a blessing to you. And I pray for the rest of the summer that is safe and healthy and worship you and all that you do. Amen. 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 Some of you uh, in here are probably real Baptist. Um, you were saved in a Baptist church, grew up in a Baptist church, baptized in a Baptist church. Two or three of you, your great grandfather was a Baptist. Your grandfather was a Baptist. The other 98% of you were not, um, and just kind of happened by fluke. You just kind of got here. And one of the things that you don't hear a lot about in a Baptist church is um, demons because we think of charismatics that cast out a demon. Any church that cast out a charisma, uh, demon, then they must be charismatic, Pentecostal, speaking in tongues, sleeping on the light pictures, kind of thing, jumping through this kind of thing, all right? However, I want you to know uh, it's a real thing. Um, demon possession is real. It still happens. There are people in our world, people in our nation, people in Randolph County, who I'm convinced biblically are possessed by demons. 
Um, I don't, we're not, we're not going to make light of it. I think it's real. I, um, this week, um, going through High Point and uh, making a turn there on um, East Chester, there were um, a group of people, several people, who basically had on very little clothes. And I mean, I mean, Myrtle Beach was like the Amish country compared to what they were wearing up there, okay? Uh, if that tells you anything. And they were carrying these signs, and, um, and I thought, wow. And they were wanting to come up to the cars and hand out um, these flights. And I thought, what on earth could that possibly be that they're handing out? And of course, I um, thought, well, I'm going to at least see what it's about. And so I rolled down my window and I'm handed this uh, little card that had a particular flag on it. And uh, what really got me, there were Bible verses on one side used as justification for what they were promoting and doing and, and all that. And on my way from there on, I thought, wow, how skewed could people be? How messed up could people be? It's one thing to choose to want to live in sin or ungodly or kill people or whatever you want to do. It's another thing to try to use the Bible to justify what you want to do. And uh, I thought, wow. And then... I think one night this week there was, you know, there was a pretty uh, lob gum in the Adams Farm community, and we had 74 locked off party yesterday with a protest, and it's like, wow. You watch the news, and it's like, how could evil keep getting worse? What is up? Why is it? The people of God, and there are crumbing. Not every single person is bound to need a bail. And it's like, oh my gosh, where are God's people? Where are they at? Where are the people who love Jesus Christ and the people who know right from wrong and the people who are, who are not perfect but who are at least saying, hey, you know what? Following Jesus may be hard, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to make sure that people know that I am a Christ follower and that I love him, I've been saved, I've been redeemed by him. The reality is we hear so much more about the evil and the wickedness and the ungodliness and the shootings and the murders and the marches and all of these. We hear so much more about that than we do. We hear about people who are actually doing a good thing, the right thing, the godly thing, the biblical thing. And the reason that is, Evil in our world is increasing, and I don't mean inch by inch, I mean a thousand miles by a thousand miles, okay? And before we meet again on next Sunday, if the rapture of the church doesn't take place, we're going to be another thousand or million miles further down the road towards evil. No other nation has plummeted as fast morally as ours since the Roman Empire. And so in this getting worse. So today, um, we, <laughs> we say things, you know, and I've said it. I've probably said it about some of your kids. That's a demon child right there, right? Um, and sometimes if you're a parent, you say, God, they act like they're possessed and uh, kind of thing. It's like, and I, you know, I, you know I'm all in for a good joke. Um, but I want you to know that it's very real. And as we increase toward the end times, and we're going to talk about heaven next week, I'm going to be a little happier, but uh, as we increase toward that, you're going to see an increase in evil and not just a little, okay? Every 10 years, we have a cultural change. Every 10 years, it tends to get a little worse, a little more free for all morally and evil and crime and wickedness, and that is going to increase. We need to know as believers why that is ultimately happening. It's not that, that, that just people are just doing crazy things. People are possessed, okay? And you are either going, there's either going to be two spirits are going to dwell in you. You are going to be controlled by the enemy, or you're going to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. 
Those are your only two options. There is none of this, well, I don't really believe in either thing. I don't really believe in the devil. I don't really believe in God. No, you are controlled. And if you are never placed your faith in Christ, I can promise you, even though you're sitting in church today, you've sung a few songs, you've mouthed a few words, you shook two hands. If, you, if the Holy Spirit of God does not live within you, you are controlled by the enemy. And that's just a biblical fact, okay? There's, there's no other option. I want us to go to Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 26. And we're going to read through uh, this passage. It's going to be a little different than what, um, what I normally do. We're going to go through it more verse by verse. I want us to get to this and uh, know our reaction, believers. Then they, of course, Jesus and his disciples, sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man. Okay, so this guy was not roaming away. He was right there. Who had demons, plural, for a long time. And then I think this is interesting. The Bible, the writer here makes it very clear. This guy wore no what? Clothes. He was naked right there. You got Jesus and the boys, they're getting off the boat, and there meets them a naked man, right? Is that weird? You go to the lake, you dock, and there is to meet you a naked man. That is a weird day. I don't care who you are, okay? And so there this guy has no clothes. It is one of the marks of demonic possession perversion, demonic influence of possession or oppression is the fact that you don't wear clothes. That's just a, I don't know, anytime you see somebody marching or roaming around, I don't care if it's San Francisco or Myrtle Beach, there is a mental issue going on. And the Bible is very clear that when that happens, there's something not right and the Bible is clear in this guy's case, he was possessed by demons, plural. Nor did he have a house, but he lived in the graveyard. A naked man meeting people on a boat and living in a graveyard, is that nutso? I don't care how you, that's, that's just a nut, okay? And this is what was going on. And then, but when he saw Jesus, when Evil encounters holiness, okay, says that he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, okay, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? The devil had control of his body and the devil had control of his tongue, okay? So he is crying out. The devil knows who Jesus is. He believes in Jesus, okay? So all that's going on, and he is speaking through, possessing this man and causing this man to run around naked, live in a cemetery, yet when he encounters Jesus, say, hey, you are Jesus, the Son of God. And I beg you, do not what? Don't torment. I think they'd had an encounter with the Holy God before. They, hey, when Jesus shows up, demons tremble okay the devil shakes when he shows up verse 29 for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man for it had often seized him and he was kept under guard bound with chains and shackles and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness jesus asked him saying what is your name and he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now, a herd of many swine or pigs or bacon and sausage, Harley. Um, make sure we pray over that food on Saturday. Uh, feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. And this is what blows my mind. Jesus even shows mercy to the demons. He answers the prayer of the demons. 
That is wild, okay? That's a merciful God. That is a gracious God. He answers that prayer, and he permitted that. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. You got this naked guy. He's possessed. Jesus cast the demons out. Jesus here did not nix, do away with all evil at this point. Now, hear me good. One day he's going to. Okay, one day he is going to. He will eradicate it forever. All right? But he didn't at this point. The demons did not die. They went to a pig. Pigs. The pigs run down. When the pigs died, the demons, I believe, go back to their home place, the abyss, the devil's house, hell, and they were not put to death. I think these demons, this spirit, these demon spirits are still running rampant. I think there are some in our world, there are some in this country, there are some in this town, city, you name it. There is a real evil force at work in our world today. The good news is, all Jesus had to do was say, hey, you're leaving this guy and you're going into the pigs. That's all that happened. They leave. This guy's he has changed. In verse 34, when those who, who fed them, who fed the pigs, saw what happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus. And what? He's got on his clothes and he's in his right mind. And the Bible says, and they were afraid. When Jesus Christ comes into a life, that life is changed. Okay? If a person really believes the Bible, if they really believe in the one true God, Jehovah, Jesus, the only way to heaven, when they place their faith in him, their life is changed. I say this every four weeks. Don't tell me when you got saved. Tell me when you got changed. Don't tell me when you got baptized, dunked. 50 times, I don't care if you've been baptized 100 times, I want to know when your life was changed. This guy went from extreme evil, demon possession, an encounter with Jesus, he puts his clothes on, his mind starts thinking correctly, and he's at the feet of Jesus. He had a desire to worship Jesus Christ, okay? And here's what people think. Well, I'm not demon possessed. You think you're not. I'm going to say it again. You're either controlled by one or two spirits, the Holy Spirit or an evil spirit that comes from the devil. No other option. There are people who are walking around with their clothes on and can pretend to be in their right mind, but they're still being controlled by evil. They're still being controlled by the devil. Every person, you're going to have to come to a point in your life where you say, okay, who really controls me? Who controls my tongue? This guy had, the devil clearly had a control of his tongue. All right? You need to, who, controls my, who controls my life? Who controls what I put first? Who controls what my priorities are? Who controls my wallet? Who controls the way I think? Who controls the way I treat other people? Who is in control? Now, hear me good. If you're a Christian, there is no way you can be demon-possessed. Okay? The Holy Spirit and the devil spirit cannot live in the same house. Okay? So if the Holy Spirit lives in you, he cannot, the devil cannot come and live in your, in your heart. However, demonic oppression is a hold of the ballgame. There are Christians who I believe are oppressed. People who are always depressed, always whining, people who are always negative, people who are always thinking, chicken little, the sky is falling kind of mentality, people who say things they, they should not say. I think the enemy can influence a Christian to do some of the most ungodly things you've ever heard of. I think that can happen. It's not because they're possessed. It's because they are oppressed, okay? How do you know if you're oppressed as a Christian, okay? You've got to stop and think, okay, emotionally, where am I at? Listen, if you wake up every day and you feel like it's all coming to an end, and I am not making light of that, hear me good. You be honest about that. 
If you feel like I can hardly get out of bed, hardly wake up, I have no motivation. Listen, I'm not sure all these people need a pill. I think some of these people are clearly oppressed by the devil. And hear me good. If Jesus can set this guy free, he can set you free. All right? He can set you free. Now, here, don't go. Our preacher said don't take pills. He said don't go. The, no, no. Listen, if you need a pill, please go get yourself a pill. All right? If that's what you need. But make sure it's on a spiritual battle going on, on the inside before you go and take a pill for it. Because hear me good. If you're saved, born again, loving Jesus, the devil is after you. And if he can't get you to dance on high point <clears throat> naked on the corner of Maine and East Chester, if he can't get you to do that, he'll try his next trip. And it may make you think everybody hates you or what, I don't know, whatever. I can't go through the whole gamut of that. But he is going to come after you and attack you. And it's going to increase all the more in these days. Verse 36. These people were afraid of what they had seen. I get that. That's a huge thing to watch and see. Verse 36. They also, who had seen it, told them by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. All right? He's out. They go to the pigs. Then the whole multitude, all of the people who had heard this story, who knew what Jesus could do, who knew that this nut who lived in the graveyard, running around town naked, he's been set free. He now has his clothes on. He's talking in a way that makes sense. They had seen and witnessed all that. They knew this guy before. They had seen the miraculous change in him. And then they say, we, we just want you to go, Jesus. Sure, we know what you can do. We, we, I mean, this guy, he's gone from a nut to a, this guy. Good God. However, we want you to leave. People say, well, if, if, if non-believers could just know how good it is, right? I used to think that. Guys, if the people who don't know Christ just knew how good it is to have that peace of God on the inside and knew what it was like to know that every sin is forgiven, you're as sure of heaven as if you're already there, if they knew what it was like to just walk around a room and just have people who genuinely care about me and who, who love me, and there are some extroverts who went from wall to wall talking to people and just because they, they like people, they eat that stuff up, okay? A lot of this church is introvert. Some of y'all turn your back completely around when you saw somebody coming. I, you know, just watch this. Like, it's like, it's good. Christian fellowship is good. If they could just feel that. If they could just feel what it's like when the Holy Spirit comes and inhabits his people when we lift up our voice in worship. If they knew what that felt like, they would run to Jesus. I used to believe that. I think I probably said that. But you know what? It's not true. The reality is these people... They saw the goodness of God right in front of them. You have a God who is so good and so gracious, he answers the prayers of demons. Who is so good and who is so gracious, who did not run from the nut, but said, you know what? Today salvation has come to your house, buddy. We're going to change your life. They saw that. And they still said, Jesus, we want you out of here. The world, the bulk of the world, as we're going to see in the next couple of weeks, they're not going to accept Jesus Christ. They're not. And we could bring in lost people by the hundreds, thousands, and millions into this place. They could see how good God is and still turn their back away. Why does that happen? The enemy, has, as the Bible says, has them blinded. And not just blinded, but in many, many cases now, he has possessed them to the point where they can't even see how good God really is. In church, that is what is so dangerous about the world that's all around us. The good news is, you and I know the truth, right? We know he came to set the captive free. We've been set free. Out of Egypt, right? We did sing that song, music boy, right? We did sing that, right? We know what that's like. And that's a good God. 
But what about the rest of the evil? This is a wild story. So, 38, the man from whom the demons, plural, had departed, begged him, begged Jesus that he might go with him. There's not many people begging to follow Jesus. There wasn't in this day. There's not in our day. He was begging. The Bible says it is like he just thronged at his feet, like a little kid holding onto his feet, wanting to go with him. <clears throat> and this was, <clears throat> was on mine. But Jesus said, sent him, sent him away. The guy he had just healed, life changed. He sends him away, and he says this in verse 39. Return to where? Go to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. Jesus did not answer this guy's prayer. Demons want to go into pigs instead of hell, and Jesus says, okay, I got you. The pigs you go. The guy who just got saved, the guy who's wanting to be wanting to follow Christ, he just says, no, buddy, you're not going with me. I don't know how much sense of humor Jesus really has. I mean, we only get little snippets of it in Scripture. I'm wondering if Jesus says, buddy, I want you to wear clothes a few months before you start following me. I don't know. I'm just thinking that's the way I think of Jesus. He may have said, when you get your clothes on for a few months, then come back. Let's see how your mind works. And he made it appeal for all I know at some point. But Jesus said, hey, I want you to go home. I don't think that's really what it is. I think Jesus said, dude, you've got a story to tell. And while there's never going to be a book in the Bible named after you, you may never start a church. You may never teach a class. You may never sing. I'm not going to build my church upon you. You won't preach on Pentecost. I want you to go home. High school reunions. <clears throat> Have any of y'all ever been to one? Do y'all even go to those things? Did y'all finish high school? Did anybody? Let's go. All right. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Here's one. And I, I went to such a small school, we don't even have them. Um, but. Uh, I do know when you get to a group of people together and you haven't seen in a while, everybody wants to tell a story, you know. Men especially are going to tell either, I don't know, I guess Trini, you got to talk about how many deer you've shot in the past 10 years, I don't know, whatever. But it's always about your accomplishment, right, about what you have done. The person, the individual at the class reunion or family reunion who gets the most attention is the person who has the most intriguing story to tell. You let the guy come in who's traveled the world and he's seen the world via plane, yacht, whatever. Everybody is enamored by this guy's story. You let another guy come and say, hey, well, uh, I went to Randleman two weeks ago. Does that count for anything, right? Nobody cares about that, right? But you let the guy talk about traveling in his yacht and his business. That's who gets the most attention. This guy was never that guy. Peter has probably been preached on a million times to one to the demon-possessed guy. And I have thought, why would you tell him to go home? If there's ever probably been a person who would have been excited about the Messiah, excited about the Savior, it would have been this guy, in my opinion. I mean, what a testimony he would have in church. I mean, can you imagine somebody standing up in here and saying, two weeks ago, I was on Main Street with no clothes on, naked, yelling and screaming at cars. I live in Floral Garden at night, just roaming around. But this morning, I want you to know, I got on clothes. I've been saying, hey, what a story, right? I mean, I'm all into that. He would have thought Jesus wanted him. But he says, buddy, you go home and tell your house. What do you do about the evil in the world? 
I can't control what's happening on Main Street. Wave, pray, and lock my doors. That's the extent of it. You can't do anything about it. Evil across the world. I think Jesus would say to us today, is there a need for people to go to the Middle East, all these third world countries and share Jesus? Yes. Most of us, though, at this point, are not going to become lifetime missionaries. There's some over here anyway. But some of you are not just not called there. Jesus would say to you today, go to your house. Make sure your house knows about Jesus. Make sure your brother, your sister, your mother-in-law, your parents, make sure they know about Jesus. Is that going to get your name in the Baptist Review, or is that going to make you uh, featured in the missions magazine? Probably not. Are they going to write books about you in 10 years about what a great, phenomenal Christian leader you are? Probably not. But out of all the stories in the Bible and about all the ways this thing could have played out, Jesus said, buddy, go home and tell those people about Jesus. We Christians love to rant and rave about lost people. <laughs> we love to talk about how evil they are and how wicked they are and, and all that. And I was reminded again this week, demon-possessed people are going to act like demon-possessed people. Evil people are going to act evil. Lost people are going to act lost. Not going to fix that law. You can every kind of law in the world, stop laws, make laws. But lost people are still going to act like lost people. I think that's why Paul told Timothy, hey, Timothy, you've got to you you, get your own house in order. Don't let people lead in church who don't have their house in order. Guard against that. I think God would say, hey, before you talk about how wild and wicked things are, how are things at, at your house? How many of you have people in your immediate family who do not go to church? About 80%. Am I concerned about people in India? Yes. But I think today, Jesus would say, do a check in your own house. Do a check at home. Do a check in, in your neighborhood. Is there going to be a lot of fanfare? No. But if you reach somebody in India or Africa, and you lose your own family. Wow. That's going to be some tough, tough out there for the first few days in heaven. Wow. It's going to be hard. So today, go home. Examine your house. Now, this next part is not going to be real popular. I hope you all ate a good breakfast. That's only the introduction. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, I do believe evil is real, and I think this guy, you have a guy who is demon-possessed. He's lived this life, much of his life. He probably went home, and you think he cleaned house? I don't mean with a broom. I mean, that would have happened later. I think his sensitivity toward evil was very keen. Now that he's been set free, his eyes are opened, he's wide open, and he's going into this thing. And I think he may have said, whoever he lived with, brother, parents, I can't imagine being married. Of course, again, some women kind of like that thing, I think. But anyway, it's like, I don't know what the home situation was like, but he goes home. And I think he had a renewed sensitivity toward what's just not right, what is wrong. I am anti against legalism, okay? And I'm not saying cut the cable and the radio, and I'm not, not about all that. But I want you to ask God to renew your sensitivity toward what is right and what is wrong. What is coming from the evil spirit and what is coming from the Holy Spirit. 
And if you ask him, he'll tell you. And to the troops over here, I'm not sure I'd want to go back and be in middle school or high school or even 20-something or 30-something or well, I'm not going to pass that, but like, I'm not sure. Because it is so hard. Evil is just so bad. But I want you to know that the same Jesus who set this guy free still sets people free. And I want you to know that when school starts in about four weeks, that greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Make sure the Holy Spirit lives in you. Make sure you're yielding to his spirit. And in your mind, when the devil plays mind games with you and he is pulling you this way and he's pulling you that way, ask God, God, make me sensitive. Is this an evil spirit trying to pull me away from you? He'll tell you. I can promise you he'll tell you. And the more you yield to his spirit, the more keen awareness you'll have of his spirit and his workings, and the easier to be able to recognize evil and what is right and what is wrong. And that's the Holy Spirit's job in you. Get that tuned up. Get prayed up. Go into that school. Go into this school year knowing how I'm going to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. If, it, if I'm made fun of or laugh at or don't have the popular guy or whatever, I'm going to yield to your spirit. Because here's what happens. This guy, it isn't like he was born wanting to live in a cemetery. It isn't like at two years old, he was like, you know what, the rest of my life, I'm going to walk around naked and yell at people. Little by little, it started with oppression, and then it started possession, to the point where he was cray-cray all the way. So be very careful which spirit you follow, who you listen to, and who you yield to. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to harp on music, movies, and TV, but I'm just going to say, make sure if the Holy Spirit checks you, you better turn that thing off the first time. Because every time, it's a little easier. If you to it. Adults, same thing. Except for you, it's Facebook and Facebook and Facebook and all that, right? Just, just be careful. Just be careful. Just be careful. Now, at some point, Christian, this is for the believers, you're going to have to say enough is enough. You can't control the why how, but you can control your house. All right? You can control your house. And at some point, you're going to have to say, you know what, enough, enough is this. If the Holy Spirit says, you know what, this shouldn't be happening in my house, you better man up and woman up if you're a single mom and say, you know what, this is not going to happen. Because some of you are letting the devil rent a motel room in your house or camp out in your backyard. And every day he's trying to get a little closer. And before you know it, you're going to be oppressed. And some of you, if you'd start yielding to the Holy Spirit and what he says, you'll be amazed at how much less medication you need, how less depressed you are, and how the blahs you have. Just yield to his spirit. Yield to his spirit and obey what he says. Stop. Don't let the devil camp out. Don't let him on the front porch. Don't let him on your deck. All right? Pour, keep it prayed away. Say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. If we stand out, we're going to serve the Lord. So today, I want you to ask yourself, number one, which spirit controls you? And just because you're not running around naked doesn't mean you're not being controlled by the enemy. Either the Holy Spirit or the enemy is controlling you. And I want you to ask yourself, when was it in my life that, man, I was just at the feet of Jesus? I was in awe of what he has done for me. Thinking straight, in my right mind, knowing right and wrong, good and evil, knowing that. When did that happen? When did that happen when you were in so awe of what Christ had done for you? Man, you weren't looking for a reason not to fall at his feet and worship. You were looking for a reason to fall there. 
When did that happen for you? When was your mind changed? When were you, as the Bible calls it, born again? Completely and radically changed. I used to hear people say, well, not every Christian is going to be radical. I guess. I guess. I don't know. I'm starting to question that. You don't find that in Scripture. Every person who was touched by Jesus was radically changed. Radically changed. And they radically wanted to follow him. And here's what I've been praying this week. Um, it's like, I take attendance every week. That's not a joke. That's the gospel truth. For those of you who move around, I still can find you sometimes. I can still find you. You know when you're not here. And I used to pray, God help them to have a burden for the people of God. God help them to love the bride of Christ, who you died on the cross for, who he's coming back for, by the way, the bride. He used to pray, God help them to have a burden. And this week I thought, you know what, I'm not sure they need a burden for the bride of Christ. They need to be touched by the bride, the groom. They need to be saved. Because every person in Scripture, when they got saved, they couldn't wait to get at his feet. This guy was begging to follow Jesus. Begging. Holding on to his legs. Take me with you. I want to go. So here's what you're going to do. Stop praying for your sister to come to church. Stop praying for your brother to come to church. Stop praying for your grandkids to come to church. You start praying, God, get a hold of their heart and save them. It's not revival, many of them. They need to get saved. There's much more about salvation than revival. And when people truly get born again, they will want to be at the feet of Jesus. For those of you who are here, it's okay to say amen. We're talking about everybody else, right? Amen, right? Want it. Do you want it? You've been changed. You've been Two questions. You just come, David Jane. Maybe play that Egypt song, but not so wild. <laughs> All right? Because that's what we're talking about. That's the whole thing. The whole thing. And you didn't even know the sermon, did you? Didn't even know. When were you set free from your Egypt? From your bondage? From your possession? Whatever it is you got. When were you set free from that? Not saying, not, not baptized, not coming to church, not grandma's prayer, not a prayer you prayed by your bed sometime and weren't chained. You can pray by grandma's bed every night, but if you're not changed, something ain't right, okay? When were you changed? Ask yourself that. And then Christian... Today, I'm not encouraging you to go to the mission field. I'm not saying go to work tomorrow and share Jesus with everybody. I'm not saying go to Walmart and hand out tracts. I'm saying go home. Go to your family. Go to your neighborhood. Your close circle of family and friends and just say, does the Holy Spirit of God control these people? Does the Holy Spirit of God possess these people? And then you need to ask yourself, how close have I allowed the enemy to camp in my house? Your life, your heart, your mind. Because in this world, it is so easy to just get washed away in whatever else is thinking and doing. If we Christians have a little limit, we won't go that far, but man, we'll go right up to the edge and like, and I, I think, church, we're playing with evil. And that's tough. That's tough. But we've got to be careful. Evil is nothing to play with it. Demon possession and oppression is nothing to play with. It's as real as we are in this room. It's that real. And the greater truth is it's that close. And so today, if, if you're not controlled by God's Spirit, all you got to do is say, you know what? I am clearly not controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. He'll save you. He'll change your life. He'll help you to think clearly and straight. And today, if you know you've edged too close, 
It's okay. We all have. I mean, it's so easy. And it just takes a few seconds to do it, okay? It just takes a few seconds to edge that close. It's okay, God, Holy Spirit, bring me back to where I know I'm supposed to be, what I'm supposed to be thinking and doing and all that. And he'll do it. God is not going to beat you. Listen, he showed mercy to the demons. He's got plenty of mercy for you and grace and help. But today, just be honest and say, okay, God, God, help me with that. Would you stand? God, today... As you told this guy, going to his own house started with his own heart. And God, before we can reach our own house, our own heart has to be right. And God, before we can share faith down the street, we've got to have to have the faith right in our own yard. And God, before we can reach the world, God, we've got to have things right in our own heart, in our own life. And God, no doubt there are people here who absolutely know they're not controlled by the Holy Spirit. And so now, Holy Spirit, we need you before it's eternally too late. God, we need you to grip that heart and God show them that it is you they really need. And God, the devil even now is trying to distract and discourage and and lie to them and make them think they're okay and they know they're not okay. And God, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, God, that you would penetrate that heart and mind and let them know it is Jesus Christ is the one they need. And God, for the Christian here, who's maybe gotten a little too close to to evil, a little too close to the wrong spirit, who's been listening to the wrong voice, God, I pray you would wake them up and God, help them to see who you are and that you love them and that your way is always better in both the short and long term. God, may we be sensitive to your spirit. And God, may we fall in love with you afresh. And God, may we yield to your spirit afresh. And see you for who you are. And today, please don't look around and stare at somebody. But be praying. If you know you're right with God, you be praying. But today, if, if you're not, you know you're not, what a great day to say, you know what, God? I want to be controlled by the Spirit of God. And maybe you're a Christian, maybe you're a parent, a grandparent, and you know evil's gotten too close to your house. And you know you've gotten people in your family who are distracted by everything from the lake to the ball game to Little League to travel ball. You know they've been distracted. It's okay. Just, God, I pray that they would yield to your spirit. God, they would choose to follow you. If there's ever been a time where you better hit, fall on your knees and pray for your family and your kids and your grandkids, we are living in that very second right now right now. So the altar is open. You feel free to come and pray. If you want somebody to pray with you, we'll certainly, we'll certainly do it. But otherwise, I'm going to let you pray. Let you pray. You pray for your house, your family.
I've been playing the game for five years. It's okay. There are people who are playing the game more longer than that. It's okay. My concern is for your soul that's going to live forever somewhere. My concern is for your life here and now. There's no way you have to walk around being oppressed and influenced by the enemy. You don't have to live that way. There's a better way. I know it to be true. And if that's you, listen, just say, just let somebody know. Let the staff know. Somebody you know, if you don't know anybody, you can get my phone number from somebody, or I'll even check Facebook and Messenger this afternoon to make sure I didn't miss something. All right, that's how serious I'm going to take it. But I want you to know. Now, for the rest of us who've been redeemed, who've been saved, who were set free, we're going to sing that song again, David Jane. We're going to sing a while, like you know. I want the full band to come back up. Listen, Poncho, the Methodist already filled all the seats. You know, we'll, we'll go after them today. But uh, if you are, if you have been set free, all right, if he has stepped into your Egypt, we're going to sing it, part of it, your favorite part, one time, and that's our dismissal. You're the God. 